A man ran down the street, crying, screaming, and zigzagging wildly and looking over his shoulder as he ran. Please, oh God, help me, he said as he ran. And then an inhumanly long arm appeared out of nowhere, grabbing him by the throat and pulling him into an alleyway. The arm was emaciated and sickly looking. Oh my God, my wife said to my right, peering out of the window. Did you see that? That arm had to have been ten feet long. I quickly shut the curtains. Get Sarah, I said, referring to our only child, and go to the basement and grab as many canned foods and bottles of water as you can. I ran upstairs to get my shotgun, grabbing a couple of boxes of slugs and buckshot and throwing them in a canvas bag. Police and ambulance sirens flew by outside, but I paid them no mind. They wouldn't be able to help much, if at all. We had tried calling a few minutes earlier, but the line had been busy. It was the first time that I had ever heard of 911 and giving a busy signal. As we all settled in the basement, a couple of boxes of food and water next to us on the table, I found an old radio that I kept down here in storage. It was covered in dust, but I blew on it, sending a gray cloud of it into the air. My wife started coughing. I sheepishly apologized, plugging the radio in and turning it on. Civil broadcast from the United States government. A robotic voice stated, As of 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, martial law is being declared for your local area. All emergency services are suspended until further notice. Please stay in your homes and await further instructions. Help is on the way. This is not a test. And then a loud beeping sound issued from the radio, and the message started to repeat. I tried changing the station, but it was coming through on every one. Someone started slamming on the door upstairs, and I heard the kitchen window directly above us being smashed. Be quiet, I whispered to my wife and daughter. They trembled, pale statues in the darkness of the basement. I heard heavy footsteps above us and the sound of someone dragging something. From further down the street, I heard screaming and wood being smashed, as if someone were kicking in a door. It sounded like a car had driven into the house next door. I heard the shattering glass and rending metal of the car hitting a structure, and then a piercing woman's shriek. The smell of smoke began to permeate the night air. I also heard what sounded like children screaming in our front yard, and a woman who was probably their mother trying to yell instructions at them. Run, she said. Get away from. But then her voice was cut off with a deep gurgling, choking sound. The voices of her children went soon after. I had a small window in the basement and I could see thick gray clouds of smoke outside. It obscured my view of what was going on further down the street. Should we go help them? My wife said. She grabbed my hand reflexively. Her hand felt cold and I could feel their pulse through her skin. I shook my head. Beth, we have our own child to worry about. I said, the radio says that martial law is declared, which means that we have to wait for the military to arrive. I listened for movement upstairs, but nothing else was happening that I could hear. I turned back on the radio. The robotic voice had stopped its monotonous repetition, and now a deep man's voice was speaking. He sounded calm and unhurried. I caught the tail end of what he was saying. The situation is under control, he said. I repeat, the U.S. military has the situation under control. What we ask from you, citizens of our great country, is this. Do not drink the water. Do not shower in the water. Do not cook with the water. Don't even wash your hands with the water. Only drink previously bottled water or other drinks. We believe this outbreak is the result of a localized infection of the town's water supply. An evacuation is in progress. Please stay in your homes and for your safety. 
phone calls, text messages, and internet access will be restricted. We will report back when more information is available. The voice ended abruptly, and the robotic voice started speaking again. This is a civil broadcast from the United States government. As of 9.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, martial law. I turned the radio back off. I looked at my wife and she was terrified. Have any of you drank any of the tap water lately? I asked Sarah and Beth. They all shook their heads in unison. Luckily, all three of us drank a lot of milk and juice. I always cursed how expensive it was having to buy an entire gallon of whole milk and a carton of orange juice every other day. But now I was thanking God for their taste. From the second floor of our house, we heard crashing and smashing, and then a deep voice shouting. It sounded like somebody was dragging a body down the stairs. A woman started crying, and then her voice was cut off. What's going on up there, Daddy? My youngest daughter asked, looking up at me with her big blue eyes. She looked so small and helpless in the dim light of the basement. She was holding a brown stuffed rabbit that I had given her when she was a baby, which she had named Dr. Hoppy. I don't know where he got his medical degree from, but he seemed to be doing a good job of keeping her calm, so I appreciated his bedside manner. Sarah, I said, getting down to my knees so that I was on her level and putting my hand on her shoulder. I think there are sick people all around us, but help is on the way. She held her little rabbit up to me. Is Dr. Hoppy going to get sick too? She asked in a whisper. No, Dr. Hoppy is a doctor. He knows more than we do about staying healthy. I said, smiling at her. And then something started smashing against the basement door, causing all of us to jump. I chambered around into my Benelli, the 12 gauge giving a satisfying ringing noise. I looked up the rickety stairs, waiting. At this distance, I could easily shoot through the basement door with a slug, but I wanted to make sure that it wasn't a police officer or military personnel, or even just a neighbor looking for help. I wished that I had cameras in the house. But as I was looking up the stairs, something came crashing through the small basement window instead. My wife and daughter jumped, yelling. Get behind me, I said turning the gun in the direction of the noise. I saw what looked like a toddler still wearing a cartoon character on his clothing, but something was very wrong with his body and face. Tendrils of gray and red roots seemed to grow out of his body, crisscrossing across his skin. One eye cried red as he looked at me, and the other had tiny gray worms crawling out of it. I could still see his pupils though when apparently he could see me for he began to run forward towards me at a superhuman speed. His mouth was opened, letting blood-red vines with spikes shoot out in my direction. Even though I watched the spectacle with open-mouthed horror, my instinct still kicked in enough for me to know that I needed to put him down. Without thinking, I fired the shot. Direct hit. He was so small that the exit of the slug blew the entire back of his head off. He fell back as if in slow motion. I saw gray and red tendrils whipping around crazily, moving much faster and more erratically as he passed. Some of them morphed at an increased rate, sending thorns and spikes shooting out, and others wrapped around its body as if trying to protect him from further damage, but it was too late. Within seconds of him laying on the ground, the energy behind the tendrils seemed to weaken. The spikes receded back inside and they began to fall randomly around and on top of his body, no longer moving. A few new smaller tendrils shot out from the wound, but those also quickly lost energy, instead of falling back into what was left of his face. Behind me, Sarah and Beth were still crying. I turned, seeing Sarah burying her face in Dr. Hoppy trying not to look. Beth stared at me with wide, unseeing eyes. She reminded me of pictures that I had seen of shell-shocked soldiers returning from a horrifying war. In all the excitement, I had forgotten about the basement door. I heard metal clattering from the direction of the door and then the lock slowly turned. 
The door swung open and what I saw there was not another person possessed by the vines like I had expected. A robed man with a bone-like face stared down at me. His hands looked skeletal, almost like deformed claws and his eyes were pure black. He smiled at me, an inhumanly wide grin that showed multiple blood-red tongues flicking in different directions. I have seen you, he said in a voice that sounded like thousands of voices swarming and echoing on top of one another. You will make it, Jason. I will return to you at the end of your journey. You are the only one with the ability to make it out of here. What about my family? I said, tears clouding my vision pointing at my daughter and wife. The hooded man shrugged. That depends on your actions, he said. It is no concern of mine. My concern is that you make it out. Much relies on your survival, but I do not intercede with mortal affairs much. I only came to give you a warning. What warning? I asked, feeling frantic. Do not trust the man in white. And with that he turned, beginning to walk away slowly. The black robe that he wore rippled and shimmered as if it were made of silk. Wait, what's your name? I asked but he ignored my question. I looked at my Beth and Sarah who were staring at me open mouthed. Within seconds, the man's footsteps faded into nothing. I think it's time we got out of here, I said to them. I prepare a few backpacks with some food and water. We'll have to split whatever we can carry between the three of us. I need to go get some things from upstairs before we leave though. I think that we might have a long journey ahead of us. My wife nodded, going through these storage supplies and finding a few bags. I didn't want to leave them alone for even an instant so I stayed with them while she packed. We gave Sarah a small bag with a few cans of food and water. Sarah also put Dr. Hoppy in it. Sorry, Dr. Hoppy, Sarah said, frowning as she zipped up the backpack. I know you don't like small spaces, but it's only for a little while. Beth and I split heavier bags with more food and water, but we didn't overload them, as I had the feeling that we might need to run. After we finished preparing in the basement, we went upstairs. I saw bodies all over our kitchen. I recognized the bodies of our neighbors and a couple of the people from town. They all had gray and red vines sticking out of their skin, unmoving. Some of them had red pouring from both eyes while others had mostly clear faces. Regardless, it looked like the robed man had torn them limb from limb. There were arms with red vines coming out of bones, heads with gray tendrils loosely hanging down from their throats, and other horrors that I don't want to reflect on here. I covered Sarah's eyes as we let her pass it all, going upstairs. I found a phone up there, a special model with encryption and VPNs installed that I kept for emergencies. My technologically savvy friend had given it to me, and now I tried it, turning it on and connecting. I was able to get through some of the government restrictions and connect to a weak internet source. No calls or text messages would go through, however. But I wanted to at least write up my story to let people know what was happening. The government will almost certainly try to cover up what is happening in our town. I plan on getting my family out and letting the world know the truth. However, no matter the cost. I led my family outside to our SUV, keeping the shotgun up and scanning both sides of the front door before they followed me out. I saw endless carnage on the street. Multiple cars had crashed into buildings, garages, and fences. And my neighbor's house was now an inferno of fire that sent out billowing black clouds into the air. Further down the street, I heard explosions. They were coming from the direction of the nearby gas station. I quickly shepherded my wife and daughter to the back seats, slamming the doors and running up front to the driver's seat, laying the shotgun on the passenger seat pointing towards the door. Backing out of the driveway, I nearly ran over my neighbor. She had hobbled out of the backyard of the burning house, waving her arms at me and shrieking something incomprehensible. 
Putting down the window, I pulled right up next to her. Mrs. Lucas was a widow who lived alone. Her husband of 40 years had been killed the previous year. He always volunteered to help the poor in the inner city, cooking at soup kitchens and trying to connect the homeless with social services as part of his church community outreach program. One night when he was leaving the soup kitchen, some guy had shot him in the chest and stolen his wallet while he bled out on the sidewalk. Cameras had caught a fuzzy image of the young man, but he was never identified. Mrs. Lucas had never fully recovered from the death of her husband, but my family and I regularly went over to check on her and spend time with her. Mrs. Lucas, I said, putting down my window. She nodded at me, tears brimming in her eyes. My house, she said simply, pointing to the blazing structure fire behind her. Everything I owned was in there. We need to get out of here, Mrs. Lucas, I said, pointing to the empty passenger seat. My wife and daughter joined in the chorus, saying, Come on, Mrs. Lucas, come with us. She wiped the tears out of her eyes, limping slowly around the car and getting into the seat slowly, sighing as she did so. As soon as she slammed the door shut, I pulled off quickly, the tires squealing. I wanted to get as far away from the fires and carnage as I possibly could, if there was anywhere to go. As I drove down the road, the fire of Mrs. Lucas's house getting further and further behind us, a massive explosion rocked the street. A small mushroom cloud of black smoke peaked above the houses further ahead. Oh God, that was the gas station, wasn't it? My wife asked. I looked in the rearview mirror. She was holding my daughter who looked shell-shocked, staring straight ahead without seeing. Yeah, I think so, I agreed. I wanted to avoid that area, so I turned left, taking side streets instead. I knew a few ways out of town through a little travel to forest roads. I didn't know if the military would be blocking major thoroughfares, and I really didn't want to find out. I still had hoped that they wouldn't have every small dirt road that wound through fields or forests blocked off, however. As we drove further away from the houses past tobacco fields that extended for acres on both sides of us, Mrs. Lucas started making strange coughing noises. It sounded like she was choking. I looked over and saw her bent over in her seat. I couldn't see her face, but she looked like she was in agony trying to curl into a fetal position as much as her old body could allow. I pulled the car over quickly, parking in front of a barn. Mrs. Lucas, I said, putting my hand on her shoulder. Please, she said between choking sobs. Oh, water. I ran out of the car, taking the shotgun with me for good measure and opening the back door. My wife quickly passed me a bottle of water and I handed it to Mrs. Lucas. She quickly sat up and started chugging the whole thing rapidly. She didn't look good. Her face was turning a strange yellow color like the jawed face of a lifelong alcoholic, and her hands were clenched into tight fists. I could see small trickles of red where her fingernails bit into her palms. As soon as she had finished the water, she sat there hyperventilating for a moment. I thought that she was crying, but then I realized one of her eyes had a trickle of blood running down from it. She turned to look at me and I saw that her pupils were different sizes, one of them fully dilated and the other a tiny pinpoint. I backed away instinctively. I'm sorry, she said, seeming to regain some control over herself. I don't know what came over me. It must be all the stress of the day. Mrs. Lucas, you didn't drink the tap water, did you? She looked at me sideways. Well, of course I drink the water from my house, young man. She said, her other eye beginning to bleed now, too. But I filtered it. Don't you know drinking bottled water is bad for the environment? Too much trash in the landfills and the oceans. She shook her head slowly and lazily from side to side as she spoke. Her voice seemed to deepen and gurgle. I looked back at my wife and daughter. Get out of the car, I whispered, 
a sense of horror overtaking me, but it was too late. A gray, sickly tendril shot out of Miss Lucas's mouth. It began to whip around wildly, my wife and daughter screaming as they felt for the door handles. Miss Lucas's arms began to make strange, snappy noises, lengthening as she raised them towards me. It looked like the bone and joints were being broken and reforming in front of my eyes. Purplish bruises and busting capillaries forming all the way up and down the skin of her arms. Her fingers were turning black, the nails turning blue, as if she were dying or already dead. I backed up out of the car, slowly raising the shotgun. My wife and daughter still weren't out of the car, but I was out of time. Get down! I yelled at them, hoping that they heard me in time. And then I pulled the trigger. The slug blew a hole the size of a grapefruit in Miss Lucas's chest, and then kept going, shattering the passenger side window. Her mouth opened, the jaw disengaging like a snake's as she hissed, spewing a fountain of red towards me. I moved at the last second as the projectile vomit missed my face by mere inches, falling harmlessly in the cornfield behind me. The smell of gunpowder mixed with something else that I had never smelled before. It was a smell like vomit and ammonia mixed together, and it got stronger the closer that I was to the tendrils. A black fluid with iridescent rainbows shimmering in it leaked out of the damaged tendrils around her chest. Tiny worms swarming and writhing in the alien blood as it soaked the seat and floor of the SUV. My ears were ringing from shooting the shotgun, but I could hear the muffled sounds of my wife and daughter still screaming. I pulled open the back door and yanked Sarah out and then gave Beth a hand. Small red tendrils erupted out of Miss Lucas's chest, languidly feeling around the windshield and back seat before seeming to run out of energy, falling limply to the floor of the car. Is Miss Lucas all right? Sarah asked in a little voice looking up at me. She had her little pink backpack on. My wife kneeled down next to her and whispered something in her ear. It felt like I couldn't talk. I just stood there breathing fast. My vision covered in a white shimmering as waves of adrenaline and anxiety overtook me. I did not want to get back into that car. I didn't know how contagious it was, but I remembered the warning on the radio. Don't even wash your hands with the water. Could touching contaminated blood infect me or my family? I didn't know and I didn't want to find out. Come on, I said, grabbing the bags from the back seat and hanging them to my family. We're walking from here. It might be better anyway. The military might be tracking cars by helicopter or satellite. I remembered seeing movies where evil corporations or governments shot anybody who tried to escape a quarantine area, and shivers ran down my spine. Jason, look, my wife said in horror, pointing behind me. I looked at the spot where her trembling finger had pointed. The projectile vomit that Mrs. Lucas had shot before her death had settled into the dirt. A few earthworms writhed on top of the soil, elongating and mutating in front of my eyes. Within seconds, they had grown to a couple feet long, sharp red spikes extruding through their slimy skin. Tiny eyes on stalks were sprouting from the fronts of their bodies at an incredible speed. Dozens of little black orbs that vibrated and searched the surrounding environment. And the new mouths opened beneath the eyes, with teeth as thin as needles poking out from their searching maws. Get back, I said, trying to push my family back from the mutating worms. The worms all responded to the sound of my voice. Raising their heads like snakes who smell prey and a few began slithering in my direction. Run. We all started sprinting down the street. The worms creeped behind us at an unbelievable pace, almost catching up with me even as I sprinted as quickly as I could. As my family and I ran for our lives, I chambered around a buckshot in the shotgun and then turned rapidly and shot at the few worms that were behind us. The spread of the shotgun blast took out all three of them, stopping them instantly. Tendrils a few inches long shot out of their bodies, searching for a moment before falling onto the pavement. 
I put another round of buckshot in the chamber for good measure, but nothing else moved around us. And then I heard a strange humming coming from further down the road. I turned to my wife. Do you hear that? I asked in a low voice, and she nodded. It almost sounds like a Tibetan singing bowl, she said. I looked at her blankly. It's a resonant bowl used for meditation that produces a humming sound. Beth knew all about yoga and meditation. I don't like it, I said. Walking forward slowly, I saw a crowd of people standing around in a circle in a grassy field. All of them with their mouths hanging open, their faces pointing up at the sky. The writhing tendrils of the infection burst out of their skins, endlessly searching in the warm air. Sometimes the tendrils would wrap around one another, and toward the center of the circle, one thick vine sent out from the chest of every monster intertwined. A smell like starter fluid and vomit rose from the group, so pungent that I could almost taste it. Before I knew what was happening, I felt the muzzle of a rifle push into the side of my head. A man dressed in all black was hiding at the edge of the tobacco field. He had used my temporary distraction to gain the advantage over me. Drop the gun slowly, he whispered through his gas mask, and don't make a sound. If you draw those things over here, you and your family will surely die. He spoke calmly, equally as if he were stating a fact rather than making a threat. I slowly put my hands up, the shotgun loosely held on my right one, and then I tossed it in a patch of grass. It fell with a soft thud. None of the members of the mutated group had noticed the sound, however. Do you see them? The man with the gun whispered to me. They're forming a hive mind. They're exchanging genetic materials. This thing evolves fast. How do you know? I asked and he only chuckled. Come on, he said, lowering his gun. You and your family are to come with me. There is a scientific installation nearby that is still quarantined and secure. We are taking the uninfected survivors there until we get new orders. I looked behind me at my family going over to join him. His words struck a chord of anxiety in me. Until we get new orders, but I wasn't sure why. What's your name? I asked the man quietly. And you can just call me X, he said. And I already know yours, Jason. We have been monitoring cameras located all over the town, as well as tracking the movement of vehicles by satellite. The government plans to restore order in this town block by block, and if it can't be done, then this place is going to be wiped off the map. There could be no risk of this thing spreading beyond here. Behind X in the tobacco fields, I saw two more soldiers dressed in all black. They were also wearing gas masks and carrying M4 carbines with sound suppressors screwed in at the ends. X nodded at them and made some sort of hand gesture, and the two other soldiers fell in at both sides of myself and my family. It involved going through the field on the opposite side of the road as the hive of monsters. As we moved, the crunching of our feet in the grass, the only sound besides, that humming coming from the field, I realized that the sky was darkening. Flashes of lightning lit up the horizon. I heard someone screaming from the field across the road. My first thought was that one of the monsters had spotted us and was alerting its fellows as to our presence. All of us whipped around, the soldiers raising their weapons but I quickly realized it was highly unlikely any of the monsters could even see us. We were hidden behind a curve in the tobacco field, looking through some of the plants to observe them, and the rapid darkening of the sky would likely make it even harder to spot our silhouettes. Instead of the monsters looking for others outside their group, two new ones were bringing someone in. I squinted, trying to see harder. The prisoner looked like a skinny young man or maybe a teenager, he had wiry black hair and glasses. He shrieked and fought against his captors the entire way, but they easily overpowered him. The tendrils of the captors had wrapped around his arms and hands like living chains. They otherwise did not touch him, except for a small gray vine that would escape from one of their mouths, 
caress the hostage's cheeks and forehead and then disappear back into the host's body. It almost gave me the impression that the hive mind wanted to keep him calmer and maybe it was just sampling the goods. As soon as the hostage was within a few feet of the group, the circle scattered, seeming to regain much of their individuality. The prisoner looked around feverishly and then seemed to notice our group. I don't know if it was the glint of some light off one of the rifles or some flash of color from our clothing, but he looked right at us. And then he began screaming, the vines wrapping faster and faster around his legs. Help me, he said, trying to point as a gray tendril wrapped around his mouth, gagging him. The monsters in the group noticed his agitation and yelling and also looked over in our direction. I was trying to crouch lower to the ground. The soldiers were feverishly whispering to each other. And then as one member gnawed open a red tendril with his bare teeth, others began running in our direction. I saw the gray tendril wrapped around the hostage's mouth pull away, and the one issuing the black fluid it took its place. It forced the young man to drink, wrapping underneath his lips as fluid spurted out of it in an arterial fashion. I nearly gagged just watching it. We have to go, X said to me, the first glint of excitement and bloodlust in his eyes. I stood up quickly, watching Sarah and Beth jog in front of me hand in hand as X led the way. The other two soldiers stayed behind us and I caught glimpses of them checking our backs multiple times. The monsters were gaining on us and if we were going much further, I had a feeling that we wouldn't make it, at least not without a gunfight. Those nearest to us out of the group began to run at a superhuman speed. My daughter could not keep up with the soldier so I picked her up and began to sprint. It was clear that we were not getting away. But then I heard sniper rifles begin shooting from the forest up ahead and I sighed in relief. My heart burst into my chest from the effort of sprinting while carrying a 40 pound child in a backpack full of supplies. The forest was only 30 or 40 yards away. The soldier stopped, let my wife and I pass by and then began to open fire with the rifles. The gunshots were deafening even though none of them were using full auto bursts. Between the hidden snipers and the three soldiers, they were taking down five or six of the mutated people every few seconds. There was a screaming sound from one of the monsters, like a wailing infant, and the rest of the group immediately stopped and scattered in all directions. A few more shots rang out and a couple more bodies fell across the field, but then everything was quiet. All I could hear was the ringing in my ears and the heavy breathing of my daughter and myself. I got a bottle of water out of my backpack, drinking the whole thing and giving another bottle to her. She just stared at it for a few seconds. Why are we getting out of here? She asked. My wife looked down at her in surprise. Of course we're getting out of here, my wife said. Why would you think otherwise? My daughter pointed to the bodies littering the field. None of those people are getting out of here, Sarah said. I saw the three soldiers entering the forest. X was looking at us with an inscrutable expression. We have a much larger group headed this way, he said to us. Satellite imagery shows that it may have been over around 500 people. Apparently the first phase has ended and the second has begun. What do you mean by first phase? My wife asked him. He shrugged. In the chaotic nature of the transformations, some of the mutants ripping others apart, total psychotic breakdowns in predisposed individuals. All of that had kept them disorganized, easy to kill as long as you had weapons. But if they are forming into larger and larger hive minds, then that will not continue. It means that our time to get out of here is quickly running out. He started walking forward again, motioning for us to follow. But luckily the scientific installation is only a few hundred yards away. We have time to get there and barricade it if necessary. They may not even know where it is or how to find it. There's nothing out this way, I replied. This is all woods and fields for the next few miles and then you get to the national park, which is another 20 miles of forest. X shook his head, smiling slightly. You'll see. The other two soldiers didn't talk at all. 
They looked unhappy and were reloading their guns. We followed X on a deer trail and a few minutes later entered an abandoned barn. He walked directly to the center of it, clearing off ancient looking hay and twigs, and revealed a number pad, where he entered a series of numbers so fast that I couldn't follow the sequence. There was a quiet beeping sound and a round concrete entrance opened up, revealing a ladder that went into a well-lit hallway a story below. We climbed down one by one. My wife, daughter, and I were redirected into a room with a couch and a television. The cable and power down here had apparently never been affected like it was in the rest of the town. I opened up my phone and found that they had open Wi-Fi access down here and began to write up my story. After a few minutes, the soldiers came back, all of them having a sour expression on their faces. The head scientists are MIA for now, X said frowning. We will have to wait. I have no idea where they are or what they're doing. They were supposed to wait here for rescue. Part of my orders are to get them out of here. I nodded to him, handing out peanut butter crackers and water to my family while I finished writing the story on my phone. X didn't seem to notice or care. Across the facility I heard another beeping sound and the faint noise of a door opening. The echo of muffled voices reached out to us across the polished hallways and laboratory rooms. Apparently the wait was over. I saw the soldiers coldly look up at the two scientists in lab coats as they walked into the building. One was a tall man with blonde hair and blue eyes and the other a shorter Asian woman. The man walked up to me, extending his hand. Sorry to meet you under such horrible circumstances, he said with a half smile. We're doing everything we can to do with this issue, those monstrosities outside. You are a Jason Emery, right? I nodded, not trusting the man at all. Where were you two? I asked. Oh, just taking some samples from the nearby stream, he said. The Asian woman looked away. My name is Dr. Booth and this is Dr. Lau. She looked back at us, nodding her head quickly. She looked incredibly uncomfortable to be in the room with us. Are we being evacuated? My wife asked. The doctor looked over at her, narrowing his eyes slightly as if Beth were a fly that he wanted to swat away. And then the charismatic half-smile returned to his face. Of course, he said, his tone one of total confidence. The National Guard, the Army, and the Green Berets are on their way. We are simply trying to evacuate as many of the uninfected to a secure location as possible before undertaking such a large evacuation procedure. But the Air Force is sending countless helicopters as we speak. I saw X and the other two soldiers look away, their faces still cold and emotionless. I had a feeling that I was being fed a line of BS, but to what end? I didn't know. I heard screaming, muffled but distinct, coming from the direction where we had entered the underground laboratory. There were panicked shrieks, gunshots, and slamming noises as I heard the hatchway open with a soft beeping noise. Help us, a male voice cried. They're coming. His words were drowned out in a deep gurgling sound as if he were choking. I couldn't see the hatchway entrance, but I heard a thudding sound as if a body were being dropped down the ladder. The soldiers looked at each other before rising to their feet and running towards the hatchway. What's going on? My wife asked. Just stay here, Dr. Booth said. The military has it under control. It didn't sound like the military had it under control in the slightest. I heard a few male voices screaming and then automatic rifle fire began echoing throughout the tunnels. I heard X yelling, Retreat! I pulled my wife and daughter closer to me on the sofa. Oh, I think we need to get out of here, my wife whispered to me. My daughter had taken Dr. Hoppy, her stuffed rabbit, out of her backpack and was hugging it tightly. Daddy, I don't want to be here anymore, Sarah said to me, looking up at me with her big eyes. I nodded, grabbing both of their hands and rising. We could use the distraction to try to run further in. I heard more and more commotion coming from the hatchway, 
and then suddenly X tore down the hallway, blood gushing from a huge slice in his forehead. It soaked the entire right side of his face. Dr. Lau and Dr. Booth were in the corner of the room whispering to each other, and I nodded to my wife and daughter pulling them up. We took off down the hallway in the direction that X had gone. Dr. Booth tried yelling something after us, but I ignored him completely. I saw drops of blood in the direction that X had run, like breadcrumbs that would hopefully lead us to the correct path. I couldn't believe how huge this underground laboratory really was. It was like a maze and without the drops of blood to follow, I would have become impossibly lost in minutes. After a few minutes, I saw X up ahead, seeming to slow down significantly. He was limping now, constantly wiping blood out of his face so that he could see. Somewhere along the way, he had lost his rifle. He pulled out his pistol, putting it to his head. Wait, I screamed at him. He looked back at me. It's too late for me, he said. I'm infected and I can feel it. Feels horrible, like something's grabbing my heart and squeezing it. He coughed up a wad of bloody phlegm, spitting it on the floor before wiping his mouth quickly. His other eye had started to bleed, but he still stared through the trickle of blood at me as he put the gun to his temple and he pulled the trigger. He fell as if in slow motion, his remnants spraying the white painted walls of the hallway. I heard footsteps running behind me and saw Dr. Booth coming up. Dang it, he wasn't supposed to die, Dr. Booth said. I sprinted ahead to the corpse of Axe, grabbing the pistol out of his hand. The words of the black-robed man who had come into my house at the beginning of all this rang in my head. Do not trust the man in white. I turned around to raise the pistol towards him, but he was one step ahead of me. He had already grabbed my daughter, and he had a small revolver that he was holding up to her head. He must have had it in a hidden holster. How about you drop that gun before I do what I want to do to her, the doctor said, smiling like a skeleton. His charismatic persona was gone now, and the monster underneath had been revealed. His eyes looked as dark as black holes. If you kill her, I'll kill you, I said, raising the gun at him. I wasn't giving up the only leverage that I still had here. My wife was standing a few feet next to him. Her eyes haunted and shell-shot. My daughter stood there like a mannequin just looking down at her shoes. I wonder what kind of psychological trauma she would have to live with after all this was over, if we survived. Why don't you tell us what this all is about? I don't believe that you had nothing to do with it. He laughed uproariously, but his eyes didn't laugh. He stayed dark and flat. You're not a dumb man, he said. I'm surprised you didn't figure it out earlier. I'm the one who released the pathogen into the town's water supply. But why? I asked. Why would you want to do that to an entire town? What? Kill them? He repeated. I never wanted to kill anyone. Though surely to make an omelet, you need to crack a few eggs. I think that we all know that. We had originally found the alien fungus, if you even can call it a fungus in a meteorite that landed in Antarctica. It appears in the world where this organism evolved. The differences between fungi, plants, and animals are not as distinctive as on Earth. On its own, the fungi can move, breathe, and even hunt small animals. But more interestingly, this fungi also has the ability to overtake any animal life and create a hive mind out of them. They also take memories and skills from the individual members of the group and use it for further ends of the hive. In our early experiments, we found that certain leaders of the hive mind, the soldiers and kings and queens, produce a substance that reverses cancer, injuries, even death, and other members of the hive. We call it the royal jelly, just like in bee colonies, but this is far more monumental of a discovery. If we allow the fungus to reproduce among large groups of humans and reach its natural state, we can find the alpha organisms among the hive, harvest the royal jelly, and use it to reverse aging, heart disease, cancer, and countless other diseases. Can you imagine the potential scientific value such a discovery would have? 
that could potentially keep people alive forever, at least those with value to the world. And how do you know that it wouldn't just turn the patient into one of those things? I asked. How do you know this royal jelly doesn't just make you a slave to the hive mind? He shrugged. It never did in animal studies, the doctor said. Now that you understand, why don't we both put down the guns? You realize that with this kind of scientific advance, your daughter could live for centuries. Just one more question, I asked. Did the U.S. government know you released this alien fungus into the water supply? He laughed at this. The U.S. government is too slow and fat to move quickly, Dr. Booth said. They gave me funding for animal studies, but no, I took it upon myself. That was the last thing that I heard him say. At that point, my wife quietly came up from behind him. She yanked his gun back with all of her strength in her right hand while slamming an open folding knife into his eye with her left hand. The shock and pain made him fire a single round, but it went high into the top of the wall. My daughter screamed, falling to the floor and crawling towards me. Daddy, she said, and I ran up to her, scooping her up and checking her for injuries. She seemed totally unharmed other than some scrapes and bruises. The doctor was screaming something, it sounded like, You but with all the blood running into his mouth, it was almost incomprehensible. My wife had taken his gun and pointed it at the back of his head. Should we kill him? She asked. I shook my head. You should take Sarah and go forward, I said. I'll take care of him. As they walked forward, I took the pistol that I had gotten from the body of X and raised it, pointing directly at the center of the doctor's head. He was blubbering and shrieking, but in his final moments, a certain clarity came over his one good eye. He stared at me with hatred as I fired, blowing it open and covering the ceiling with what was left of him. Even a little bit of it splashed back on me, tiny droplets that scattered over my mouth and face. As I looked around at the mess, everything that had gone on, I had a totally absurd thought. Well, someone's going to have a heck of a time trying to clean this up. I thought to myself, laughing like a maniac. We wandered through the hallways for hours before accidentally stumbling upon Dr. Lau in a room. She was sitting in the corner drinking a cup of tea. She looked up surprised. As she took in the three of us, covered in blood and scratches, she frowned. Is he dead? She asked simply. I nodded and she sighed. Oh, thank God, he was a lunatic, Dr. Booth. I was afraid of him. I always thought that he would try to make me into one of those things without telling me. Maybe putting a drop of it into my tea or something. He became so obsessed with seeding the fungus into larger and larger animals that I knew it was only a matter of time before he tried infecting humans. I had no idea that he would do it to a whole town now. She stopped and sipped some more from the green tea. Do you know a way out of here? I asked, holding my daughter close to my side. She nodded. You know, he was going to take you and your family as subjects, she said. Purposely infest your whole family. I nodded at that, thinking back to the warning of the black-robed man. And yes, there's a way out that leads to the middle of the forest. I'll take you there, but I'm not going with you. I'm staying down here until the reinforcements arrive. If they ever do. We followed her through the labyrinth of halls and rooms until we reached a ladder at the end of one hall. At the top was a hatch. The code is 339. Good luck. She turned and went back in the direction that she had come from. I climbed through it, helping my daughter and wife out. We looked around and saw a seemingly endless forest. Luckily, I had grown up around here and I knew a lot of these woods like the back of my hand. I knew that we were in a state park that bordered the tobacco fields at the north of town, and that the park had trails extending to the surrounding towns. It was only a matter of time before finding one of the right ones. We hiked for miles, eventually coming to a clearing. In it, I saw another circle of mutated humans, their tendrils intertwined in the middle. Beneath it, I saw the corpses of Axe, half of his face missing. 
They allowed drops of some black liquid to fall into his open mouth and he began to stir. Tendrils shot out of his shattered face, sewing up the hole and leaving a writhing mass of stubby gray spikes in its place. In low grunts, he pointed to various directions. The tallest and strongest members of the group ran in those directions. I heard sniper rifles firing and then men screaming, and within minutes, everything was silent. I thought to myself that this must be the royal jelly that the doctor was so obsessed with. It appeared that it could even bring back certain infected individuals from the dead. The hive mind still gathered and I wondered if they would use the knowledge taken from X and the other soldiers to break any military quarantine and expand beyond the borders of this destroyed town. As I thought about this, I saw all the members of the circle moving their heads up in unison. They turned their faces up to the sky, their mouths open, as a soft rain began to fall.